I'm Rachel Stewart, president of Gardner White Furniture. We invite you to join us as we salute those who have served our country. On behalf of everyone at Gardner White, we are proud to present Fox 2's tribute to our troops in a commercial free format. We sponsor this program to thank veterans and their families for their sacrifice and service. The following program honors the men and women who put their lives on the line for our country. For that, we're all grateful. Thank you for joining us as we now present Fox 2's tribute to our troops. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rich Luderman. And I'm Amy Lang, and we want to welcome you to this year's tribute to our troops. Over the next 30 minutes, as we've done for the last 20 years, we're dedicating our focus on honoring those who have given so much to our country. And this year, we're so excited to be at the Yankee Air Museum, a celebration of aviation. But on this day, it's a celebration of all veterans. And we begin with some modern day heroes with the Michigan National Guard. I always wanted to be part of something bigger than myself and leave my imprint on history, if you will. It's been a fun experience because I've got to meet a lot of people and I've got to experience things that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to do without being in the National Guard. I joined the Air National Guard and uh, best decision ever made. Purpose, place, direction, discipline. The Michigan National Guard also requires sacrifice. It's a lot more than one weekend a month and two weeks a year. For some, it's a full-time career. Joining the military has, has been a great benefit to me personally. I've learned a lot of different skills over the years. Uh, as well as giving me a profession that I love. 42-year-old Doug Isham is with the Michigan Army National Guard as a Chief Warrant Officer 3 at Sulfridge. He's a Chinook helicopter instructor pilot. He's served active duty Air Force, Air National Guard, and now Army National Guard, deployed multiple times to Iraq and Afghanistan. My wife and I joke uh, that we have had a wartime marriage um, because it seems like, you know, that's, that's what it's been for a long time. It's also been full of adventure and opportunity from a mechanic to a pilot. He was destined to fly his father, Air Force active duty, his mother, a general aviation pilot. Now he pilots a 28,000 pound Chinook helicopter through war zones and natural disasters like humanitarian relief after Hurricane Harvey in Texas in 2017. Well, that was one of the most rewarding experiences of my career, uh, being able to use the aircraft and, and support the people down there. For 27-year-old Amber Ainsworth, joining the Army National Guard has allowed her to work full-time as a digital content creator at Fox 2 News and get her master's degree paid for while serving her country, her community. I was helping with a COVID mission. That was when testing was really big when the pandemic first started. So I was running back and forth, picking up test kits, preparing test kits, and it was really cool to be part of that and feel like I was actually helping because I signed up to be able to help with these kind of things. And with the pandemic, it gave me the chance to assist with that and making sure that test kits were getting where they needed to be and we were tracking the pandemic and making sure that everything was going well. She even met her fiance Rachel while both were serving in the National Guard and while they won't make the Guard their career, others have. When I retired at 40 years I looked back and I said wait a minute it just started. I, I did I had such a great time that that 40 years just flew by. Wayne Fetty retired as Chief Master Sergeant from the Michigan Air National Guard, spent his career in aircraft maintenance, and now he's helping the families of soldiers, sailors, and airmen through the enlisted Heritage House at Sulfridge Air National Guard Base, recognizing that those in the National Guard come from all over the state and need a support system. The enlisted Heritage House hosting all kinds of events so families can connect. And they can start to build their network. And uh, so when they're deployed, they have somebody to lean on, somebody to share those, those issues with. Family, support, that's what makes all these deployments possible. Doug Isham grateful to his loved ones for the sacrifices they've made so he can serve. I think it's been a, a, an excellent opportunity for me. I learned valuable skills and life lessons. Um, hasn't always been easy. But looking back on it now, uh, I, I recommend it to anyone uh, to change your life in a positive way. 
As a veteran myself, this annual tribute to our troops holds a special significance to me. Back in 1989, I was commissioned a second lieutenant through the Air Force ROTC program and served on active duty for four and a half years. Six months of that time, I was a weather officer in Operation Desert Storm. Now, the military can open many different career paths for those who serve. I recently caught up with one veteran who shared her unique experiences as a U.S. Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine, an impressive title that lasts a lifetime. Since 1775, U.S. Marines have fought on the front lines for our nation and for our freedom. Patty Potts from Highland Park, a Marine who proudly enlisted right after high school back in 1987, and she says becoming a Marine was right for her. It gave me more opportunity and more um, understanding of how the world works at, at, at a very young age. Even during boot camp? I remember boot camp, and, and I think I remember it more so as that, you know, the process. And when we got there, we had been up basically all night, and they, you know, they rushed us off the bus, had a stand in formation, and they immediately they started yelling. And I started thinking, what have I gotten into? After successfully completing boot camp, Patty was sent to train as an ordnance specialist in an aviation unit, but because of an eye problem, she was ordered to Albany, Georgia. I was reclassed as a baker in the Marine Corps. And this is me when I first was like, what? I, I come to serve my country and not make cookies and cakes. She did her job and she did it well and ended up in supply. At the end of four years, she needed to come home. My father was sick and um, he was um, diagnosed with cancer and that's what, what prompted me to say, you know what, I need to be closer to home. So yeah, that's why I got out. She and her sister, who is an Army veteran, both know that supporting veterans will be a great part of the next chapter. My sister and I are even thinking about starting a nonprofit for housing in, in, you know, in Highland Park because there is such a need for veterans and housing for them to kind of be able to bridge that gap from being homeless or semi-homeless, you know, and having, you know, a stable place to stay. A Marine with a mission. So I, I just want to continue to, to evolve and learn. I think when, once we stop learning about the world around us, that's, that's when the doors become closed and our world becomes small. Patty is a proud mom, a proud wife, and a proud Marine and truly understands the sacrifice made by veterans. It is so beautiful for me. It, it warms my heart to see that, you know, these people of, of wars past have been remembered. We thank you, Patty, for your service and dedication. Much has been made about America's role in World War II. It's been recounted and romanticized in books and on screen since the 1940s. And we're going to honor some of those heroes in just a moment. But firstly, Thomas introduces us to a group of World War I era fighters. These men, many from Michigan, played a unique and little known role in U.S. history. My grandfather's photo. This was taken on Belle Isle on July 4th, 1919. That was the day after the first elements of the polar bears returned to Detroit. His uniform, his medals, a family's honor. In this display case in Frankenmuth, Michigan, is the only reminder of one of the only times in world history American soldiers fought on Russian soil. It happened in Archangel a town 600 miles north of Moscow in Arctic weather in July of 1918. Mike's grandfather was one of 5,000 men sent from Michigan to Russia, known as Detroit's own. But on the way home from that battle, they gave themselves a new name, the Polar Bears. Well, the Polar Bears are a group of American soldiers who fought the Red Army, the Bolshevik Red Army, in North Russia back in the winter of 1918-1919. It's a little known story. Uh, it's uh, mostly been buried in the history books, but it's kept alive here in Michigan because of the fact that the majority of those men that went there were from the state of Michigan. Mike Grobel is the grandson of Clement Anthony Grobel, who was a corporal in Detroit's own 339th Infantry Regiment. 
And Mike is also the president of the Polar Bear Memorial Association, a group that keeps the men and memory of this battle alive. This episode between the uh, men in North Russia and the ones in Vladivostok, uh, that's really the only time we've ever invaded Russia and fought Russians on Russian soil. Michigan Heroes Museum in Frankenmuth is where you'll find these precious artifacts in a special section for the polar bears with actual pieces from the battle. Some of the more interesting items. John Bosich is the curator of the museum and he shows us ration canisters, weapons, and even the original armband of the men. But one of the most interesting pieces is this American flag. When the, um, the Americans first got to Russia, they were under British command, which they uh, absolutely hate being under a foreign government command. The other thing most probably problematic with them is they had no American flags when they got there. So, um, and they hated serving under a British flag. So some wounded guys uh, were recovering in a hospital and they took a Russian flag, an imperial Russian flag, which is red, white, and blue, and they tore it in strips and then sold it together and they created their own American flag. Patriotism, honor, and respect for a group of men that did something that has never been done and that is not really taught. Even a grandson didn't know it first. I knew my grandfather as uh, just being my dad's father, a nice, kindly guy, always doting on his grandchildren. I never really knew he was a war hero. He never talked about it, not even to his own children. But this room speaks volumes for the men that are not here. Their uniforms are still intact, and these medals still have shine as their honors will never be forgotten. The Polar Bears Memorial Association even extends the honors to the final resting place of many of the battle's fallen soldiers. Because Detroit's own 339th Infantry Regiment from Camp Custer, Michigan will live on through the stories told by their families, some in attendance, and by a grateful nation. And also in Fox 2's Tribute to Our Troops. I'm Lee Thomas. The last living member of the Monford Point Marines 1st Platoon has passed away. He actually broke a 167-year color barrier when he joined the Marines. Taryn Asher with his inspiring story. My sister went upstairs and said, Dad, it's time to go to bed. And he said, I'm tired. And when she turned to pull his covers down, she heard him take his last breath, and he was gone. A few months shy of his 100th birthday, Henry Ball died a peaceful death in his sleep inside his Detroit home, a departure from life the dedicated soldier deserved. Being uh, excellent under duress, he didn't want us to fall apart. Uh, it was nine of us. Of course, everything wasn't always easy, but he taught us that, that you can get through the tough times and you can get through it well but you got to hold yourself together. Their father's war stories he often shared exemplified his excellence. Devastated by the attack of Pearl Harbor, Henry joined the Marine Corps, becoming one of the first black Marines to fight for their country. Armed forces may have become racially integrated, but the five brave black Marines still face discrimination from the moment they arrive for training at Montford Point, North Carolina, separate from Camp Lejeune. He said that when they were approaching the camp, they were so excited, the soldiers were cheering, but the bus didn't stop. It went past the white camp. And then when they got to their camp, there was nothing there. But they, they were still excited, so they built them a camp. Known as Top Gun, Ball rapidly advanced through the Marine Corps ranks, promoted to gunnery sergeant in the 51st Battalion. The sharpshooter courageously fought in World War II, but would come home to a rude awakening. I thought, wow, you just came back from fighting for your country, but then you get treated like you're not a part of your country. Henry married and raised nine children in the Jeffries Projects, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Detroit. But with a focus on education, discipline, and their faith, the Ball family escaped poverty and moved to the west side. Even before we understood what a soldier was, mm -hmm. he was disciplined. He was very intentional about everything that he did. Having nine kids coming from the projects, were successful, successful. went to college, yeah. nobody got in trouble. 
that's that's his legacy. And because Henry helped blaze the trail, future generations of color had the opportunity to fight for their country. A proper honor finally came for the gunnery sergeant in 2012, when President Barack Obama awarded the surviving members of the Montford Point Marines the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's a great honor. Commander Robert Middleton witnessed that historic moment. Having uh, generated these relationships, uh, you know, with these men, it was like you're holding the hand of fleeting history. We stand on their shoulders. These men are the ones whose shoulders we stood on and opened up doors for us. Robert worked closely with Henry as they led the Montford Point Marines, now a nonprofit organization that works to preserve the group's historic legacy. They became dear friends. He was one of the most extraordinary individuals that I have ever met. He was an exemplary leader, he was a business and professional man. He was a family man. For his family, the loss of their patriarch weighs heavy on their hearts, missing his love and the endless stories that were always wrapped in a life lesson. On Veterans Day, a feeling of comfort, knowing his historic legacy will live on. My dad served his country served. with pride and with honor. And then with integrity. I'm Taryn Asher. Now to the story of a World War II veteran, a flyboy I first met right here back in 2006. That's when he and some fellow flyboys had the chance to soar again in this B-17. Yeah, I was just 18 when I went in and I came out when I was 20. Bill Rosenai is now just shy of 98. Nearly 80 years ago, he was a navigator on board a B-17 in Europe, fighting in World War II. He had to be nimble and he had to be a lot younger. We met him back in 2006 as he and some friends, fellow flyboys, were taking flight once again in this B-17 called the Yankee Lady. We went along as they relived their youth, recently watching that story once again with Bill. God, we look so young. Bill is now the last of those flyboys, still sharp, still sharing stories of his service. This is exactly the plane that I flew. We named it the Little Chapel because everybody in the plane was praying you know <laughs> don't 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 hit me don't hit me you know? oh but he did get hit now my third mission is when i got shot down bill says they had been knocking down german oil refineries when it happened we lost an engine right away on the right side then we lost an engine on the left side but this one we couldn't feather so we started down right away and it was horrible to look up and see all those planes further and further. As we were going down, the planes got smaller. <laughs> he says they dropped their bombs and started throwing everything out of the plane. We did everything we could to lighten the plane, but we still kept coming down. We got to a point where the pilot said, well, if you're going to bail out, bail out now. But they didn't jump. Instead, crash landing at a German airfield. The Americans had taken over, destroying the B-17. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Well, the thing was, it was the third mission, and I had 32 more to go. That really didn't bother me. A grand total of 35 missions, and then he headed home in one of the first ships to arrive in Boston after the victory in Europe. The crowds of people, you know, they were waving at us and shouting and everything. We, they, we were the, uh, the first ones to actually get back home. Bill would go on to the University of Michigan on the GI Bill and study mechanical engineering. He got married, had three daughters. He worked for Ford Motor Company for 32 years and was married to his wife Vivian for 73 years. She passed away last year. Now his doting daughters care for their dad. They take care of me, really take care of me. And he says the VA takes care of him too. He was recently hospitalized after a second bout with COVID, but he keeps going. Going. Just last year, he was honored as the University of Michigan's veteran of the game in their biggest game of the year against Ohio State. I always say the 111,000 people came to see me, and there was also a football game. When going through the tunnel, they were hanging over the heads, you know, 
t touched me like I was a rock star or something. <laughs> Bill is kind of a rock star. That day, he even met Heisman Trophy winner Charles Woodson. He is my hero. He's, the, to me, the greatest player that ever played for Michigan. Guess there were two heroes in the big house that day, but only one flew in a B-17. Thank God that I was flying in one of those. <laughs> the beauty of it is it can take a beating. A lot like this guy, still the greatest generation. I'm lucky to be alive and still among the living. And on this Veterans Day and every day, we salute you. The thing I like is the people that respect the fact that you I did something during World War II. Oh, you did something, all right. Hard to believe it was almost 80 years ago. And still, we thank you for your service. Thank you for serving. Uh, boy, you look young. I get that so often, you know, that uh, <laughs> you, you, know, you know, it looks like you're 97, you know. <clears throat> almost 98. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And he's determined to live to be a hundred. That's my goal. There's no reason why I can't do it. Wait, what's the goal? Hundred to be a hundred. Yeah, just that, I don't know what happens after that, but that's. <laughs> And while the men were off at war, an army of women were hard at work doing their part to support the effort on the home front right here at Willow Run. And at other factories throughout the arsenal of democracy, this summer a special event was held to honor some of the original Rosie the Riveters. Women like 99-year-old Betty Hinsman and the other Rosies had no idea they were making history at the time, but we now know they played a critical role on the home front when they went to work in the factories as the men who held those jobs Jobs went off to serve our country. Sometimes I was on top of the canopy I was a rivet gun. And as we salute these strong women and their accomplishments, they hope future generations will never forget Rosie the Riveter or her work ethic. Guardian angels come in many forms, including some with four legs. There's an organization providing for fully trained service dogs for veterans and for first responders at no cost. Yeah, and they rescue them, raise them, train the dogs to be devoted companions. And as Erica Francis shows us, they're already finding success. This scene, a standing pair. It's no small feat. You'll see why in just a moment. Come on, up, up. The one on the right, an army veteran of 12 years. The one on the left, his right-hand man. He, he's very talkative. And Matthew McMurray's guardian angel, who's walking Matt through PTSD. This is Cobalt. A six-year-old blue German shepherd who Matt received free of cost four years ago through guardian angel's medical service dogs. That same day, I felt uh, a renewed sense of um, being, you know, I just, I, I felt completely restored at that point. That's the goal. The Guardian Angels service dogs help first responders and our military resume a normal life. They help stop nightmares, night terrors. Trained to detect distress, symptoms of PTSD, depression, panic attacks, anxiety. The dogs are also working with those with traumatic brain injury, diabetes, mobility issues, even seizures. We have to help our veterans and first responders who have given so much to our country and our communities and their lives are changed in ways that are not always positive. That's Mary Lamparter, the regional coordinator for Guardian Angels in Michigan. Next to her, Nancy Dakin, a 30-year Air National Guard veteran and service dog trainer. We've often heard the statistic of 22 veterans per day take their lives. So at Guardian Angels, we like to base our success right on the fact that we've been around for 12 years have paired hundreds of dogs across the United States and haven't had a single suicide. Evidence shows that compared to drugs and therapy, veterans often show lower PTSD symptomology, reduced depression, and increased social participation when paired with a service dog. What? Show me. What do you want? <laughs> what the nonprofit wants now is to help more people. They don't have enough Michigan recipients applying for the service. And of course, there's no shortage of the need for funds. All right. The cost to raise, train, pair, and provide lifetime follow-up for each service dog is around $37,000. Our dogs go through 18 months to two years of training before they're paired. For this pair... Oh, there we go. It's been priceless. I can't imagine life without him. His four-legged friend helping the hero put one foot in front of the other. Watch me. Life for Matt, no small feat. Thanks to these paws, he's learning his life is worth living. <laughs> 
Thank you for joining us. And thanks to the Yankee Air Museum for their hospitality and letting us use their beautiful facility here at Willow Run. Each year we end with a special honor for those servicemen and service women who lost their lives fighting for our freedom. We must never forget their devotion, their bravery, their dedication. We salute their service and their sacrifice. And we want to end with the words of a poet who was also a World War I Canadian Army Lieutenant Colonel by the name of John McCrae. During World War I, McRae saw bright red poppies blooming on the war-torn fields where so many soldiers had lost their lives. He was moved to write in Flanders fields, and it's why red poppies are still one of the most recognized symbols for soldiers who have died in conflict. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below we are the dead short days ago we lived felt dawn saw sunset glow loved and were loved and now we lie in flanders fields Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields.